بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم in the name of Allah the gracious the merciful to him we belong and to him we shall return we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite mercy to send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our parents. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our dear brothers and sisters across the Muslim world and across the world as a whole who are facing great hardship. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to remove the hardship from upon them wherever they may be. There's a lot of virtue that goes unnoticed with regards to sending peace and blessings upon the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in our series, a salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is critical. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, that only the miser is the one who does not hear the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and does not send peace and prayers upon sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you think about it, the reason why this person is a miser, because what is a miser? Someone who has, who does not give, correct? Last time we spoke extensively about who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in our life. And undoubtedly we recognize that we are wholly indebted to the Prophet ﷺ. And he has given us much and inshaAllah he continues to give us much. And so when we hear the name of Muhammad ﷺ, we say Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Muhammad ﷺ. That's not to discuss the virtues. Every Friday, the Prophet ﷺ is presented with those who send peace and prayers upon him ﷺ. And the Prophet also teaches us that there's a correlation between the amount that you send peace and blessings upon him in this world and your closeness to him in the afterlife ﷺ. And the list goes on. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that whosoever is facing a hardship or has something that has a need to be taken care of, send peace and blessings upon Muhammad ﷺ. So inshaAllah, our intention throughout this series and throughout our lives with our families in our homes is that when we hear the name of Muhammad ﷺ, we become jolted and we send peace and prayers upon him. And of course, above all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends peace and blessings upon him and he ordered us sallu alayhi wa sallim Now, I know you guys want to get into the seerah and especially Mustafa, I know he really wants to get into the seerah. But we need one more week of a necessary, inshaAllah, introductory session before we jump head first into the seerah. And inshallah next week we will begin talking about the world that the Prophet sallallahu was born into. The world that he was born into, what did it look like? That is next week. This week inshallah. So last week briefly we spoke about what? We spoke about the secession of prophethood with ending with the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We spoke about the majesty of Muhammad in all of its glory. We spoke about what Allah has said about him, what he will mean for us in the afterlife, what he means for us in this life. We spoke about the secret connection between us and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we ended off with a verse. We said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Uswatun Hasana. And we agreed that this verse is teaching us to immerse ourselves into the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's the point that I want to start today. We understand that the Prophet is valuable. Everyone here agrees 
the Prophet is valuable, the Prophet is great, we need the Prophet in our life, I have to know the Prophet But the question now is, how do I approach the seerah of the Prophet How do I learn the seerah of the Prophet There's a group of social scientists who wrote a book about influential change. It's called The Influencer. In this book, these scholars, a group of social scientists, they speak about how a person can achieve genuine change in their own lives or change in society as a whole. And they point out that most people think that to affect true change, you need the right amount of motivation. You need the right amount of willpower. As long as I'm motivated enough, as long as I have enough willpower, I can make the change that I want. Right? Most people think this way. As long as I really want it and I have enough motivation, I'll change. But what they point out is that more often than not, people have the right amount of desire and motivation to change. But they still fail at changing. And so they say that the reason why most people are not able to change the habits they have, if I want to change a bad habit or I want to adopt a good habit, more often than not, it's not that I don't have the right dosage of motivation, it's that I don't actually know how to change. I don't know really what it takes to change. And this is a very key point for our sake as we're approaching the seerah. If we just expand beyond the seerah for a moment, just think about your own life. I want to be a religious person. Everyone here who's a Muslim, and I'm not sure if there are non-Muslims, but all Muslims and non-Muslims want to be good people. And Muslims want to be good Muslims. I want to be a practicing Muslim, correct? And we believe that we try. And we do try. And we try and we try again. This year, inshallah, Ramadan comes, I'm going to finish the Quran, I'm going to do this. Ramadan comes and I don't do the things that I want to do. I want to really start focusing on my relationship with Allah and praying on time and so on. I have the motivation, I have the desire. Reality comes, I fail once and I don't do it. And I fail twice and I don't do it. And I fail a third time. These succession of failures, they lead you to what? Hopelessness. You tell yourself, I tried so hard. I did everything that I could do to change. And I want to be a better Muslim, but it never worked out for me. I never could be the Muslim that I wanted to be. See, what this principle is teaching us is that our problem is that we don't really know how to become better Muslims. We don't really know what it takes to become better Muslims. So of course, if I keep on trying, and I'm not getting the result that I want, I end up losing hope. This religious business, it's too hard for me. Because I tried so hard, I tried so hard, but I kept on failing. So I give up, or I lose hope. Or when I think about it, People, I hear the shaykh or I hear someone talking about coming to the masjid and praying Isha or Fajr. I kind of cringe because I know somewhere I'm supposed to do it, but I've really never figured out how to do it regularly. And this is where the Prophet ﷺ comes in. The verse that we started, we ended off last time, we're going to start off this time with لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْأَخِرِ We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What this verse is telling us, the only way to be a genuine, true, good Muslim is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The word kana, 
infers in the rhetoric in rhetoric in Balagha infers continuity. Kana means spans all time and all place. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is relevant all times and all places. And the word fi it infers this immense inness, if you will. Everything about the Prophet everything that he did, everything that he was, as he was, that is how you arrive at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So step one, we have to understand the only way that we can become these good Muslims that we want, the only way to do that is by fully immersing ourselves in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We can't continue our lives progressing, trying to be good Muslims, and I don't know who Sayyidina Muhammad is, and I don't know what he means in my life. That has to stop. And we have to really, really immerse ourselves and follow. قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ Follow, obey Allah and obey His message. The second point in this regard is now I understand that the Prophet ﷺ is my vehicle to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, correct? He is the vehicle. He is the way, he is the roadmap, he is the one who will take me to Allah. How then do we approach the Prophet ﷺ? How do I learn from the Prophet ﷺ? How do I follow the Prophet ﷺ? And this is the million dollar question. How? The first step that is required in the process of learning how to follow Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu is understanding myself. We have to understand our own subjectivities. And I know that's a bit of a big word, but bear with me. Last week was very spiritual. This week, it's all here. <laughs> so I need you guys with me here. I need your ears, your, your, your heart, your mind, because this is a bit intellectual, a bit philosophical, but I want us to, inshallah, really, this is an, a very important introduction to before embarking upon the journey of seerah, this introduction is key, in my humble opinion. And so let us, inshallah ta'ala, pay attention and bear with me in these few moments that we have together. So the first step is understanding our subjectivities. By, by that I mean, I need to understand what makes up who I am. What motivates me? What encourages me to do things or not do things? What informs my opinion? What informs what I like and dislike? And the reason why this is key before embarking upon the study of Sirah or any of the sacred sciences is because more often than not, what tends to happen is when we approach the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, what informs my opinion of the seerah are my subjectivities, my insides, what I feel and believe and like, kind of in an arbitrary sense. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. A friend of mine once mentioned to me, a very close friend of mine, I trust him, that a man told him, and this man was a doctor. He said to him, that doesn't mean anything about doctors, but this man was a doctor, I'm sorry. He said that if the Prophet ﷺ were alive today, if he was alive today, the Prophet ﷺ would be flying, jet-setting from Rome to Paris, to Spain, Los Angeles, Manhattan. He would be wearing custom-made suits, driving the nice of cars. Oh, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, if he were, that's what he would be doing. Now it sounds comedic. Now, what is this, what's happening in this man's mind? He has a very specific idea of what greatness is, of what perfection is, of what something spectacular is. That is very much informed by what? By the culture that he lives in. And so, as individuals, if we, as people now, we are definitely products of our society and our culture. All of us here, born and raised in the modern day world, we are very much products of our culture. We can venture to say that we have PhDs in culture. We know what we like, 
We know we like nice cars. We know we like nice things. We know we, we feel certain things about life and, and, and what's good and what's a nice time and a fun time. But all of that is kind of built into us not knowing how. But then when it comes to our deen, our religion, our Islam, what is our knowledge of our Islam and our deen? Some basic information. Some basic Quranic concepts. Some basic ayat and ahadith. An understanding that the masjid is good. Go to Friday prayer, etc. A set of basic understandings. If I have this profoundly massive entity known as culture, and then I have this thing on this hand, known as religion. And I put the two aside of each other. More often than not, we will subvert our religion under our culture. And we will begin to read into our religion through that very specific lens. You with me? Did I lose anybody? You got it? Kind of. Okay, let me repeat. Just like this man who went and approached thought about the seerah, he had basic understanding about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And in his mind, if the Prophet were here today, the Prophet would be doing jet setting, nice suits, cars, etc. Because in his mind, that's what the Prophet should look like. If that is the case for that man, what is it in our case? How do I approach the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? How do I look at the Prophet ﷺ? There's no doubt that the Prophet ﷺ very much speaks to our time and place. And we know that the Prophet is relevant to all times and places. So how do I make sense of my culture and the Prophet ﷺ? How do I make sense of this whole enterprise of I want to follow the Prophet ﷺ, but I have this culture? And I have these sensibilities. And I have developed this very specific way of life. We have to, we have to, when approaching the Prophet ﷺ, and this is the point that I really want us to drive home. We have to first and foremost, debaggage. We have to approach the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, putting our bags aside, putting our subjectivities aside to the best of our abilities, and going to the Prophet ﷺ and saying, Ya Rasulullah, I am here. Please, teach me everything that you have come with. I am going to submit to you, Ya Rasulullah, in all entirety. Why do I say this? In the past hundred years, when people, many people who have written about the seerah, they'll write about the Prophet ﷺ and they'll say, the genius of Muhammad ﷺ. Abqariyat Muhammad, the genius of Muhammad. Or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a leader, right? The great leadership qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no doubt that the Prophet is a genius. There's no doubt that the Prophet is a great leader. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also much more than all of that. You know, my concern in this regard is that some of us, when we come to revive the Prophet, we'll try to revive like a John C. Maxwell or a Tony Robbins. And we'll look at the Prophet Wasallam, and we'll look at the great people of our time and we'll start to read into the seerah the things that are impressive to us. So today, John C. Maxwell, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, these are the power players, these are the people who create big things that will take all of that and will read it into the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam. And so when we go into the seerah, we will downplay the signs and the parts of the seerah that sound odd to us. When we go, for example, read a part that says that the Prophet ﷺ rode a magical burak and went up to the highest of heights. Our sensibilities in the modern day would tell us that sounds odd. Really, the Prophet rode a horse and he went up? That doesn't make too much sense. Or when we read certain things about the Prophet and his marriage to Aisha, I, get, I, I feel that that sounds also a bit odd, so what I'll do, I'll push it aside. I'll sweep it under the rug, because it sounds odd to me. 
And so if I'm going to the seerah, and my, what informs me is a very specific psychology, I will miss out on much of what the seerah is about. And much and what the seerah is about is what the Prophet ﷺ did and said. That is the seerah. We're going to the seerah saying, I have no doubts about you, Ya Rasulullah. Any doubts that I've heard, I have no doubts. I'm not going with any preconceived notions. I'm not going with any excess baggage. What you are, Ya Rasulullah, is perfect. You're exactly what I want to follow, just as you are. And to the best of my abilities, I'm going to put my baggage aside. Right? And the reason why this is important is because we realize that the Prophet ﷺ is a transformative entity. And he can create great change in society. We saw what he did during the time of the companions. We saw what he did to the Arabian Peninsula. We saw that he affected tremendous change. He genuinely transformed society, correct? Now we want the Prophet ﷺ to transform us. We want him to change us and what we're about. Now, if what we do to the Prophet is we simply take the Prophet, we put on a nice suit on the Prophet ﷺ, and we say, Ya Rasulullah, now you are relevant to our times. That I simply just go to the deen, I go to the Prophet, and I bring the Prophet, and I read the Prophet, I read the aspects of the story of the life of the Prophet that sound nice to me, that make sense to me, that feel good to me, the sides that sound odd or doubtful or something, I sweep them under the rug and I gloss over them, and then somehow I expect that the Prophet is going to transform my life. If any of us were to look at the lives of the companions, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina, all of them, the transformations that they went through were profound and they were extreme almost. Where they were and how they altered, it was an intense change that they went through. And it wasn't easy. The transformation that they made in their lives through the Prophet ﷺ was profound and it was not easy. If we want the Prophet ﷺ to transform us the way that he transformed the companions, we have to follow the Prophet the way the companions followed him. We have to realize that, hold on, I have a lot of baggage in here. And I've learned a lot about what the Prophet is and what good is and what bad is. And no, no, this part of the deen is not good. And this part of the Prophet's life is questionable and so on and so forth. And somehow I expect that the Prophet is going to change me. And the Prophet is going to transform me the way he transformed the Sahaba and the Arabian Peninsula and the world that he came into. So if every society, if every generation, the way that they deal with the Prophet is simply taking the Prophet as is nice to them and as is seemingly meaningful to them, then how is the Prophet supposed to make the change that he's supposed to make? Is that point clear? Ahmed? Is that point clear? Okay, good. Ahmed's my uh, clear point guy. Now, the reason I emphasize this point One of the problems that we have is that we are disillusioned from the Prophet ﷺ and from our deen. We don't have a real strong connection. There's a distance between us and the Prophet ﷺ. And what I want us to appreciate is that there is a reason for that. There is a reason why we, as products of the modern day world have a problem with religion that comes out of a very specific place. It's long and it's extensive, but it has a lot to do with enlightenment and post-enlightenment, the scientific age, the industrial revolution, a lot of aspects of the modern world which have defined religion in a very specific way. 
And we are very much a product of that. And so when we come to religion, a lot of us, without realizing, have a problem with religion. You know, this man who wrote about the genius of Muhammad wasallam. When he wrote about the Prophet, you know what he did? He highlighted the Prophet as a great governor, as a great political leader, as a great this. He commanded these armies, he was this great figure. But when it came to the miraculous parts of the Prophet's life, he pushed them under the rug. When it came to some of the quote-unquote doubtful issues, he explained them away. Oh, oh, no, no, that's not the case and whatever. There's this seemingly very convenient explanation of who the Prophet is. And when you read that book, you think to yourself, wow, the Prophet's just like Tony Robbins. <laughs> you know, The Prophet is just like any of the great leaders of our day, quote-unquote. And that is the concern I have. Is that, what, is that what that man did when writing the genius of Muhammad, we do the same thing. That because we are, we are unaware of this problem that we have with religion, this struggle that we have with religion, as a modern day society, scientists are the ones who tell us what is logical and illogical. When we want to know something is good and makes sense, we go to scientists. Something that doesn't make sense, go ask these religionist people because they probably believe in the super fantastical things. You know, you watch Bill Maher and, 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 or religious or whatever and he talks about, oh, so you believe in this magical horse? And we kind of cringe and we're like, yeah, I kind of do. And we have doubts in that. Whereas in reality, wallahi al-azim, that is much more logical in my estimation than anything he believes in. I have absolute conviction that everything that the Prophet ﷺ came with is perfect. And what is good, and what is right, and what makes sense, and what is logical, is everything that the Prophet ﷺ was. Nothing about the Prophet ﷺ is doubtful. Nothing is illogical. Nothing is wrong. Nothing about the Prophet ﷺ. And I say this knowing full well that we have a lot of doubts, we have a lot of questions, we have a lot of thoughts, and I want you to pose them. Don't feel bad, pose them. But what I'm telling you is, the disposition of us as Muslimin is that we look at the Prophet wasallam and we know that he is the perfect guide. خَيْرُ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ The best of Allah's creation. سَيِّدُ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ He is the Sayyid of this world and He is the Sayyid of the afterlife. The master of this world and the master of the afterlife because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who told us that is the case. And so please brothers and sisters, as we're jumping into the seerah, let us be very mindful that we leave our baggage at the door we leave our preconceived notions at the door. We leave everything at the door and we say, Ya Rasulullah, I am a blank slate and I am ready to follow and submit and do what you ask me to do, Ya Rasulullah. I understand that it's not going to be easy. I understand to make the changes that I have to make and for you to transform me the way you transformed that first generation, that I have to do work and it's not going to be easy. Because all too often, and this is, another, this, this is another product of our modern day idea of religion, religion is not supposed to challenge you. Religion is supposed to make you feel good. Religion is supposed to come like a nice auntie or a, a hagga in Egypt and just tab -tab -tab, tab you on the back and say, Habibi, you're okay. You're good. There's nothing wrong with you. Don't feel judged. I'm not going to judge you. You do whatever you want. Whatever makes you feel good, do it. That's the psychology of a lot of us towards religion. We don't want religion to challenge us. We don't want religion to make us feel that we have to actually do work, that we actually have to sacrifice, that we actually have to go through a process of change that is not easy. We all know one of the sunan of our world is that change does not come easily. Change is a difficult process. And yes, to make the changes that we want to make in our lives, it's going to require an effort. It's going to require a struggle. 
And inshallah ta'ala, if we are sincere enough, if we are honest enough with ourselves, if we truly are sincere about following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will give us tawfiq and put barakah in our lives to make the changes that we want to make. You know, I was trying to think of an analogy to explain this point. And the best thing that I could think of is, you know, in pop culture, this idea of the, um, the Zen master, the Eastern Zen master, and then you have this Western protagonist who comes from some world and arrogant and whatever, and then the Eastern Zen master is sitting, and they come, and he puts them through all of this challenges and these obstacles, and you know the, 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 the you know Western person is generally rejecting and fights it and is hard and finds it odd and rejects it and rejects it. But day in and day out, month in month out, until the Zen master breaks them down and rebuilds them, and they slowly rebuild them to become what a Zen master themselves. That is similar to what I'm trying to talk about. We need to kind of deprogram ourselves and then reprogram ourselves according to the Prophet we, we need to understand that it's a process and that change is not easy and that inshallah ta'ala bi'ithnillah ta'ala we will be able to as we progress week in, week out, month in, month out through the life of the Prophet we absorb everything about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and inshallah we'll be able to change or affect the change that we want to in our lives. The last aspect in this regard, and then we'll move over to the sources of seerah, because this is also a very important part of introduction before we get into um, the actual seerah next week, is how we like to learn. One of the things about our time is that unless knowledge is entertaining, unless it comes to me in the clip of a five minute 10 minute YouTube clip, I'm most likely to gloss over it. Because it's not fun, it's not entertaining. If it's not entertaining, I'm not gonna enjoy sitting and listening. I need it to make me laugh. I need to hear a nice story. Now, there's nothing wrong with the speaker or the teacher or whoever being creative, artistic, and so on in their speech. And there's nothing wrong that we utilize the various methods that we have to teach people. But for ourselves, when we come to learn, we have to realize that learning is a process of sitting down one, two, three hours and reading, listening, studying. We have to drop this idea that unless it's entertaining, I don't want to listen. Unless it's fun, it's not going to be something that I'm really be too interested to come. Last time or this time or I listened to that sheikh speak once and you know they, they sounded like a professor so I don't want to listen to them anymore. You know I want the person who's going to make me laugh in my talk because that's what's fun and exciting and entertaining. I want us to be conscious that that is the case and we need to change that about ourselves. We need to sit down and learn how to learn the way our pious predecessors have learned century upon century. And even today, people who learn and accomplish great things, they spend time reading. They spend time reading significantly. So that's just one final point in that regard. Inshallah, we'll conclude this next part two is about the sources of the seerah of the Prophet I'm going to go through the sources of Sira quickly and I'm going to conclude with two points about why I'm talking about the sources of Sira. So bear with me, this is going to be a slightly textbooky, but inshallah we'll get through it and it will make sense to us in the night time. The ulama say that the primary source of Sira is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, parsed in it, all over it, are various parts of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So you see accounts that speak about the Prophet Sallallahu various ghazawat. You see events that happened to him. The hadith of if for Sayyidah Aisha. We see, for example, the ghazwat of Al-Ahzab and various other aspects of the Prophet Sallallahu parsed out through the Qur'an. And the ulama did a very diligent job of taking and extracting these aspects from the Qur'an uh, al kareem So that's the first source of seerah. The second source of seerah is the books of Sunnah. The books of Sunnah that we have, this rich Sunnah tradition that we have, is full of speech about the Prophet ﷺ. Things, events, accounts about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. One of my shiuch said that there are around 60,000 ahadith. If you remove the 10,000 that talk about fiqh and aqaid and other things, you have around 50,000 ahadith that just simply speak about the life of Muhammad ﷺ in various ways. But we don't call the books of Sunnah seerah because the books of Sunnah, generally speaking, are organized according to fiqh. So we have, for example, the, the chapter that speaks about purification, prayer, hajj, and so on. Or it's organized according to narrators. So we have the Qur'an, we have the books of Sunnah. And then we have the children of the Sahaba who began to write certain aspects about the Prophet's life. Usually, generally the Maghazi, the, the, the battles of the Prophet And that lasted for that generation and the one that came right after it. They would write about various aspects. Much of that is lost, some of it still exists. But what we have to understand that the oral tradition from the Prophet that he spoke with the companions, roughly 10,000 companions, and they spoke to their children and the tabi'een, and that, all of that was greatly preserved in an oral tradition, handed down orally. Just like we have the Qur'an today, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ was orally transmitted generation to generation. The first time that the seerah is collected as a new body of work in the Islamic sciences is with a scholar by the name of Muhammad ibn Ishaq. And this is roughly the second century of the Hijrah. He dies around 150. He is the first person to collect the seerah as one body of work. And him and the scholars in his generation were doing very similar things, but he is the most notable figure. Much of that is lost to us in written form today. Parts of it exists, but much of it is lost. The book of Sirah, the first complete book of Sirah that is written, that we have, is written by Muhammad, uh, Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham, who, is, who comes a generation right after Muhammad ibn Ishaq, he is the first complete book of Sirah that we have, that we have existing until today, in the written form. And people might be confused about this idea of oral and written, one thing we have to be very aware of is that the oral tradition in Islam is extremely rich and extremely powerful. The main way in which the Qur'an is preserved in our hands until today is through the oral tradition. The millions of people who have the Qur'an memorized. That is how the Qur'an was preserved from point one, from minute one, until today. Just like the Qur'an was preserved, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was preserved in a similar way. And the ulama developed sciences, hadith sciences, very intricate sciences to take care of the riwayat, the narrations, preserve them, make sure that this is sahih, da'if, correct, or weak, etc. And the sciences of the rijal, are these men, are they trustworthy, can they be taken from? A very intricate sciences, science that has preserved our tradition. So we have after Muhammad ibn Ishaq, Muhammad ibn Hisham, and then various scholars after that, century after century, who were collecting the narrations about the Prophet wasallam and organizing them in a nice chronological form about the life of the Prophet from beginning to end. Someone like Imam al-Tabari com compiled around five volumes in his massive jami'ah just dedicated to the Prophet wasallam's life. Someone like Ibn Kathir in his Bidayah wa Nihayah, also many volumes simply dedicated to the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the list continues. But every generation, the ulama concerned themselves with the seerah of the Prophet. In every generation, they wrote extensively about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And what they learned, they taught to the generation that came after them, and the generation, generation that came after them, and so on. Some of the books that I want us to be aware of, and that we inshallah should have on our own bookshelves. You can buy them, some of them are here in the bookstore, and some of them you can definitely buy them online. But I want us to pay attention to these names, write them down, inshallah, have them in your bookshelf, as references to the seerah of the Prophet The two books that I really want us to have, everyone should have on their shelf. One is the Shifa of Al-Qadi Ayyad. The Shifa, the Shifa meaning the healing, it's called a Shifa bi Tarifi Hukuk al Mustafa. It is a book by a great scholar from the 7th century, Qadi Ayyad, who writes extensively about the Prophet's life. But not just about the Prophet's life, but the adab, the, the, the traits that we have to embody ourselves with when studying the seerah of the Prophet. The hukuk of the Prophet, the rights, upon the, the rights of the Prophet upon us. How we should treat him, when we hear his name, what we should do, how we should defend him. He speaks about some of the characteristics and so on. So that is a very important book for everyone to have. It is translated into the English language. It's written on top, Muhammad, and it's translated by, by uh, Aisha Bouli. Another book to have that is very important is the Rahiq al Maktoum. And I'm sure everyone has it, the sealed nectar of Al Mubarak Puri. This is a very good book to have if you want the exact dates and names and events of the Prophet's life. It is very and is based on the narrations of the ulama. Other books that are good are Fiqh al Sirah of Sheikh Muhammad al Ghazali, Fiqh al Sirah of uh, Al Sheikh uh, Saeed Ramadan al Bouti is also a very good book. And finally, a very important book to have is the Shama'il of Imam al Tirmidhi. The Shama'il genre of works are the, the books that speak specifically about the Prophet Wasallam's character traits, outward and inward. And this book is the most seminal work in this regard. Most of the scholars who speak about the shama'il, the descriptions and the characteristics of Muhammad outwardly and inwardly, take it from this book, the shama'il of Amim al-Tirmidhi. So inshallah, we should all make sure that we have it. All these books are translated into the English language. Now why do we speak about the sources? Why do we even concern ourselves where the sources, where the sira came from? The first point that I want to mention in this regard is this. If we don't understand where the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ came from, we don't really understand who we are. We brothers, our Islam, this deen that we have, everything about our Islam, everything about it is inherited from the generation before us. And the generation before us inherit everything they had about Islam from the generation before them. This Islam that we have has been handed down to us generation after generation after generation. And so if I am not aware of the sources of my deen, the sources of my religion, then who am I? Really? If I am disconnected from the sources, then who am I as, a, as an individual? When I say I'm a Muslim, what does that mean? What do I know really about my heritage, about the history of scholarship in ulama? Brothers and sisters, our Islamic intellectual history, the heritage that we have is remarkably rich. Scholars generation after generation after generation have handed down this very rich tradition of Islam. In all of the Islamic sciences, they've written extensively and they've transmitted it orally and written generation after generation. And one of the problems in our modern day is that there are movements to cut us off from our tradition, from our ulama, from our history. Because once you cut yourself off from that, you stand wobbly. I'm not actually sure what I'm standing on. I'm not actually sure who I am. I'm not actually sure, I don't know where to learn from. If I really want to learn my Islam, where do I go? 
And the reason why the methodology of these ulama was so profound is because it preserved the deen generation after generation. And every generation built on the generation that preceded them. Not only did they inherit, but they preserved, and they learned, and they taught. And the way they learned, and the way they taught, was inherited as well. If you want to study the seerah of the Prophet, this is how you study the seerah of the Prophet. This generation teaches the generation after that. And so you see a beautiful symphony almost happening throughout the centuries of how the uloom are transmitted, how the sciences are transmitted, how the seerah is transmitted. Then you come to our time, and things are kind of all over the place. Everyone is writing, as the Egyptians like to say. Right? Everyone's writing according to their own desire. Being disconnected from our tradition, our ulama. And that is the danger of being disconnected. Because when we stand firm on the shoulders of our ulama, we will definitely raise high. We absolutely, in our society, in our generation, we're going through a very unique time in a very unique space, in a very unique struggle. But we should definitely not try to solve our problems and deal with our times by being disconnected. Because we're going to fall flat on our face. Why not stand on the shoulders of our giant ulama throughout the centuries, this rich and beautiful inherited tradition, why not, as we try to deal with our issues and our problems, stand on their shoulders? And learn from them. And learn how to learn. And learn how to learn the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Learn how to understand the sacred sciences of Islam. Who better to teach us than this preserved transmission from the time of the Prophet ﷺ until today? Who better? So inshallah ta'ala, as we're studying the seerah, we're learning that we are building upon our ulama. We're learning the way the ulama learned. You know, one of the aspects of these books of seerah that I spoke about is that they are heav heavily narration-based. You'll see the an'ana, the, 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 you know, this narrator speaks after this narrator, after that narrator, and so on. A lot of us, we look at that and we get bored. Like, okay, just, you know, give me the actual words. But that is extremely precious. The fact that we know the people that gave us the information generation after generation, that is priceless. That is beyond priceless. And the fact that we have it preserved is even more priceless. So how do we downplay that? How do we brush that aside? That is a problem. And we, so we have to make sure that when we're studying, we're studying the way that they studied. We're learning the way that they learned. And when we come to approach our own realities, we stand on their shoulders. And we build off of them. You know, their books were heavily narration-based, like I said. You'll hear, you'll just see this event narrated, this event narrated, this event narrated. Today when people come to talk right about the seerah, they'll do away with the narrations, they'll kind of absorb their own opinion about the Prophet and then write a book of seerah. That is problematic. That is problematic. Because who then are we turning the Prophet into? Are we simply turning the Prophet ﷺ into a fraction of our own selves in our own times? Is that who the Prophet ﷺ is? I think we can all agree that he's not. It can't be, logically. Can every generation of people come and just turn the Prophet into whoever they want him to be? However we think he should be? That can't be the case. If we do that to the Prophet of this generation, what's going to happen to him the next generation? In ten generations from now? So clearly the way in which we preserve who the Prophet is and what he brought us is by preserving the tradition of our ulama until they came to us and they brought it to us today. And so that is why I wanted to spend some time speaking about our sources, the sources of seerah, and we will depend heavily upon those sources in these lessons as we try to, like we said last time, functionally integrate the Prophet into our lives. 
we are building upon our ulama and we are learning from them okay so with that inshallah ta'ala next week we will jump into the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will start the journey of talking about the world that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born into but before we do that this week we're going to spend time you know decluttering our minds Deprogramming. We're ready. We're going to the Prophet. We're saying, I'm leaving all of my baggage at the door. And Ya Rasulullah, I am ready to be changed as you see fit. And I'm ready for you to make the transformation in my life that you made in the lives of your companions and the tabi'een and so on. I'm ready for it. I'm going to follow you step by step, Ya Rasulullah. I'm going to listen to you step by step. I know what it takes now. I know it's going to be hard, but I'm ready for the challenge, inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transform us the way that He transformed the pious, our pious predecessors, that Quranic jeel of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Prophet sallallahu our ultimate guide in this life and the next. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who love the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who yearn for the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who find nothing more pleasing than following the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all of his glory, all aspects of his life. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make us of those who love everything about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make us followers of the Prophet. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to make us of those who are under the banner of Muhammad in the day of judgment, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to have mercy upon us, to guide our hearts to beneficial knowledge. If you have any questions or thoughts or concerns, please go ahead. Ask for questions if there are questions. Before we do the questions and answers and questions before everybody gets up, inshallah, uh, just two, two small announcements. One is, please make sure you sign in on the sign-up sheet um, and make sure it gets back to Sister Huda Ziyadi on this side or the Omar Abul on this side. Um, and the second thing is, um, please, please, you know, if you have a Facebook account, like the Facebook page and it'll help you get some of the announcements along with getting on the email list. And you can also email the ICBC Young Adults account to also get on the email list that we weren't able to get on today in trouble just for updates on the way we're doing things. So I ask you to sit for a few minutes or if you're going to leave, then please leave respectfully and quietly while we have some questions and answers each other. The question is a shifa of Al Qadi Ayyad is a shifa written by Al Qadi Ayyad. Right? And in English, I think they spell I Y A D. And then the Shama'il of Imam Al Tirmidhi is of Imam Al Tirmidhi, the famous hadith scholar, Imam Al Tirmidhi, who has his own Sunan. That is who the Shama'il are written by. Assalamu alaikum. So, for all the brothers and sisters that got up, if you're going to leave, inshallah, that's fine. Because we know it's a little late, but please just sleep quietly and sneak outside if you're gonna gonna speak, inshallah. Just so everybody else can kind of judge you here. It seems like no I'm gonna get a wireless mic for questions if I can. Are there questions? Any anyone have questions? Questions? No questions. Okay. Oh, there's one question over here. Wait. Um, you're talking about how um, we should treat the Possibly should be restricted to the reflection of our subjectivity. So, which is why we should differentiate between religion and culture. Um, to what extent does Islam allow us to um, be involved in our culture? Is uh, the Islamic tradition completely aversive to all culture traditions or just aspects of the matter on the side? khair for that question, and, and I appreciate and I and this was my concern about this point, so <laughs> it's good that you voiced it. I, in no way or shape or form, am saying that our religion is, uh, is averse to culture, or it contradicts culture, or rejects culture. But I have to I'm not saying that, because no doubt, there are aspects of every culture that are good, and there are aspects of every culture that are bad. What I was emphasizing is that, let us be very careful, that when we're coming to learn from the Prophet 
We're not forcing our culture on the Prophet Okay, that is the, the concern that I have. We shouldn't reject culture, we shouldn't throw it away, we shouldn't do away with it. No, we are all products of our culture in many ways. And we recognize that one of the miraculous natures of the Prophet ﷺ is that he is relevant to all times and all places. And in that spirit, we realize that yes, he does very much speak to our times. Now, does the Prophet ﷺ speaking to our times mean that the Prophet is simply just the average Joe of our time? No, obviously that's not the case. And obviously the Prophet ﷺ is to make much greater changes. And this society, just like any other society, every society we believe needs the Prophet ﷺ. And this society, the one that we live in, needs the Prophet ﷺ. And it needs the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. And it can be changed by the Prophet ﷺ. And we need to be the vehicles of that change. Okay? So, this is not an idea of religion contradicts and fights with culture. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm simply thinking here is be very careful that when you're reading the seed of the Prophet, not to read it through that very specific lens, of my culture, turning the Prophet into simply one of the people in my culture. That's what I meant in that regard. I hope that's clear. You said uh, very eloquently that we should stand on the shoulders of the Ulama mm -hmm. to learn and to understand how the Prophet lived and to learn from him. And how do we do that as, as, as common people who haven't gone and studied the Ulama and their texts? And it seems like it's a daunting thing to, to consider this. How do you get your arms around all the things of the centuries and say, well, standing on their shoulders is a common man coming into the living and interpret the prophecy? Very good question, Zekalakhir. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that you or, you know, we, everyone has to go in and, and learn, uh, you know, everything about the scholars and so on. You know, we should all be, we should all try our best to learn as much as we can. But what I am pointing out, my concern in this, this specific session is simply us developing a level of necessary awareness. It's one thing for you to be the person who is the scholar who is doing that work, and it's another thing for you to be aware that that is the case and that is what it needs to happen, and that's what I need to do. And that's what needs to happen, that's what preserved our religion. Those are two very different things. You as, 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 as someone who's coming, you come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have shuyukh, you go and you sit with them and you learn, and you do your best to ask them for guidance, what kind of books can I read, what kind of scholars can I read, something for my general basic level, etc. So that's something that you can definitely do. Alhamdulillah, you have access to scholars and shuyukh, go ask them, where can I read, how can I study, what's a good book for me to read? But it's very important for us, all of us as commoners, to understand that, hold on, I do come from a very rich tradition. And I do have a lot of ulama that I can build off of, that we can build off of as an ummah. So I don't need to sit here and reinvent the wheel. I don't need to be shooting from the hip, trying to figure out what Muslims need to do, per se. We need to really build ourselves completely off of that and traject from there. And it is very much informs my identity. That I have confidence, izza, confidence in what? That I am, I am an extension of all of that. Right? When you walk in society today, and you feel that, you know, who am I? Where do I come from? You know, these, everyone seems to be so developed and so advanced and so remarkable. And the Muslims seem to be retarded. You know, and I, I am sorry to be blunt. But that's, some of us psychologists tell us that. But is that really the case? Are we really this backward people? Hashanallah, wallahi al-azim, the greatness of the Muslim heritage is profound. We need to learn it. I can't tell you right now, but all I can tell you it is. And it is rich. And no one will deny that. And people who have studied and who are honest, academics, Muslims and not, they have shown and they have seen how profound Muslim heritage, especially our intellectual history is. So, us as regular Muslims becoming Familiar with that is key. It's very important to our own psychologies and to our own religiosity, to our own identity, 
and how we learn and how we grow and how we inshallah come close to Allah and His Messenger. So I hope that's clear. Yes, bro. Go ahead. No, you can sit down. Like, I'm not good. Yeah. And of course, we are blessed with Allah and the way the Lord has been asked from one generation to another, and there are volumes of books. But the problem becomes that this is where this is going to become a blessing of the curse. What is the sense how we are divided, how one army does not agree with the other army, they cannot do what they do, the moon's fighting, what we are seeing in the Middle East. But it's a common man that you begin to doubt what's going on. Is it the problem of transmission or is it too many armies? <laughs> yeah. See, Zakallah khair, brother, and you're and you're touching upon a point that is very important, and that is that the brother is saying that you know we have a challenge. I have a problem personally that when we look, we see a lot of differentiation, people, a lot of differences. People are fighting with each other. People are arguing with each other. There's a lot of confusion. Correct? And you're right. There is a problem. And I'm not going to hide it from you. There is a problem. But the problem is not in the deen. The problem is never in the deen of Allah. You know, one of the beautiful aspects of our deen is this idea of the ijma of the ulama. Right? The jumhur, the, the, the overwhelming majority of ulama. And for the very large, for very large parts of our ummah, generation of generation, you have this huge body of ulama who function in a very specific way. And they inherited the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu in a very specific way. And that was transmitted and preserved century after century after century. Today, yes, as we have disconnected from that rich tradition, you see a lot of the confusion that you see today. This is my estimation, that this is one of the great problems. Is that because we're so disconnected, everyone is coming out with their own opinion, basically about what should be done and what should not. And that's why I do agree there's a problem. And one of the first steps to dealing with that problem is reconnecting to our heritage. Reconnecting to the ulama. Re-understanding what they did and how they did it. Understanding the schools of fiqh. Understanding ulama and how they organize themselves. The principles that they base things on. Difference, by the way, difference in and of itself is not something that we try to run away from. There are differences of opinion in fiqh that we, we absorb and that we embrace. But the differences that exist today, that the ones that you're touching upon, they are problematic at times. Because there are opinions that are not recognizable. There are opinions that, and it's the way we differ. We insist that it's monolithic. It's just my opinion, every other opinion is wrong. So there's a problem with being disconnected from, from our tradition. And the second part is adab, understanding our conduct. How do I conduct myself? How do I deal with difference? That's another major problem. So one is you can say intellectual in nature, and the other is spiritual character based in nature. We don't understand where we come from really, and we don't understand how to differ. And so these are the two aspects that I think we need to work on to inshallah arrive at the, the, the harmony that we're looking for. But it's a challenge and it's going to take time. But this should never allow you to lose hope or anybody in that matter, for that matter. Never lose hope because this is a test of our time. And this is a test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for us to be in. So we embrace the test and we try to deal with it and we try to change it. But it takes time. And it takes effort and it's going to be a struggle inshaAllah ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to Sabeel al Rasha, to the best of pathways. So inshaAllah, our brother Abdullah has uh, the question microphone in. So next he says if any questions, he has a little bit of speed and he gets here pretty quickly. So this is the question that they can ask. Any more questions? No? Yes? Thank you, sir. I was just wondering, when you say Dusia, when you say Dusia in general, how can I make it so I can compare myself to somebody who's listening to another story? Because you know, sometimes we listen about another story, so I said, if you say it's a story, how can I not do it? 
Were you here last week? Wait, no, you were here last week? Okay. So, the, the remedy to that is to understand who the Prophet actually was. And that's specifically a point. So you may hear a story about person A, person X, person this. What distinguishes the Prophet ﷺ is what we spoke about last time. His uniqueness, his greatness, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about him, what he means to us, he is the source of our salvation. We said last time, for example, there is no Iman without the Prophet ﷺ. I and you cannot be believers without the Prophet ﷺ. Not because I decided that, Allah is the one who subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. Right? So the Prophet is clearly, and we mentioned this extensively last time, clearly and truly the best figure on this earth to have ever existed. And he is the source of our salvation in the afterlife, in any type of success in this life. So when I'm listening to something about the Prophet wasallam, I'm doing my best to understand, hold on, this is the Messenger of Allah. This is the Prophet of Allah. Listening to him and following him as he was, is exactly what I have to do in my life and nothing else. When it comes to my opinion versus the Prophet's opinion, my opinion means nothing. I completely sub submit myself to the way of the Prophet And the list goes on in all honesty. But going through the seerah, as we are inshaAllah ta'ala together every week, is a great entranceway into learning who the Prophet ﷺ is, really, in all of his majesty, everything about his life. And in that way, inshaAllah, we can grow to learn and love and understand that I have to follow the Prophet ﷺ in entirety. Uh, I think inshaAllah ta'ala, we'll close there. And this... Jazakumullah khair. I, I, I thank you for all the questions and inshallah, we'll see you next week. Uh, inshallah.